Hierbij open ik deze academische zitting aan de Universiteit Maastricht. En ik zal vanaf nu de ceremonie in het Engels leiden. My name is Ton de Goeie, I'm the pro-rector of this ceremony and also the chair of the uh, degree committee. First of all, I would like to welcome Mrs. Uh, Pascal Heinz. Uh, she will defend in public her academic thesis, which is entitled Social Participation in Dementia, Experiences and the Role of Technology Through an Occupational Lens. Uh, welcome all members of the degree committee. Um, and in particular, I would like to welcome the four supervisors. Uh, first of all, the first supervisor, Professor Marjolein de Vught. She is uh, 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 professor in psychosocial innovations in dementia at Maastricht University. Professor Frans Verheijen, he is um, uh, professor in neuropsychiatry and geriatric psychiatry. Uh, the two co-supervisors sit on the right side, uh, Dr. Lizzie Boot. Uh, she is associate professor in technology innovations in dementia and their sustainable implementation at Maastricht University. And Dr. Anne Neve, and she is associate professor of accessible mobility and travel behavior at Hasselt University in Belgium. Um, I would like to introduce the six opponents later during the uh, academic session, because if I mention all those names, you will certainly forget. Um, welcome to you here in the aula, and welcome all followers of the live stream. Um, Mrs. Heinz, may I invite you to uh, present a summary of your thesis, and I wish you success in the coming hour. The floor is yours. Thank you. Dear Pro-Rector, members of the Corona, dear colleagues, family and friends, within the upcoming 15 minutes, I would like to tell you more about the research outlined in my thesis, Social Participation in Dementia, Experiences and the Role of Technology Through an Occupational Lens. As we all know, we're living longer. People get older thanks to existing medications and a healthier lifestyle. With that, more people are also expected to live with dementia. Dementia is not a single disease. It is an overall term to describe different symptoms that one may experience when living with a brain disease, such as Alzheimer's disease. One common dementia symptom is memory loss. But there are also other symptoms such as difficulties with orientation or difficulties with concentration, which makes it harder to follow a conversation, for example. National policies advocate for aging in place, which means that most people with dementia in the Netherlands are living at home. While we know from research that they also prefer to live at home for as long as possible, they can experience difficulties in their daily lives. One thing people with dementia can experience difficulties with is engaging in activities that provide social interactions with others. Research actually shows that people with dementia often experience a shrinking world when it comes to their social life. They see their family and friends less often and might even lose contact to some friends after diagnosis. At the same time, they visit fewer places outside the home to do activities with others. Some people with dementia don't go to a restaurant anymore or don't go on vacation anymore because of the changes dementia brings. However, engaging in social activities has a lot of benefits for one's health and well-being. It helps the brain to stay active, but also has positive effects on autonomy and life satisfaction, and creates a sense of identity. Therefore, it is important to find ways to help people with dementia stay engaged in social activities that they find meaningful. Because healthcare costs are rising, and there's a shortage of healthcare professionals, many people view technology 
as an accessible solution to support people with dementia in their daily lives. However, while research shows that technology can help people with dementia to remember things, such as taking their medicine or going to a doctor's appointment, little is known on whether technology could also help people with dementia in their social life. Therefore, my research focused on these two questions. First, how do people with dementia engage in social activities? I wanted to better understand how people with dementia experience their social life and what shapes these experiences. Then I also wanted to know whether technology could help people with dementia to engage in social activities. When I talk about technology in my presentation, I mean all kinds of technologies that provide interaction with others, such as mobile phones, laptops, but also robots or gaming technology. As I am an occupational therapist, I looked at these questions through an occupational lens. But what is an occupational lens? First, it is important to understand what an occupation is. An occupation is a subjective experience, an experience that is meaningful for them and can't be repeated. One term that is often used in the same way is the term activity. But what is the difference between those two? An activity is a culturally shared idea of something we do, like going to a restaurant. If I say, I'll go to the restaurant this evening with my family to hopefully celebrate my doctoral degree, you all know what I mean by that. I will be sitting at a table with my family ordering food, chatting about the day. To me, going to a restaurant this evening in the beautiful Eupen is an occupation, a subjective experience that can't be repeated. While we could go to the same restaurant tomorrow, I could be feeling differently. There could be other waiters. I could eat something else. <laughs> what makes an occupation unique is just the context. From an occupational perspective, experience can't be separated from the context in which they take place. Let's move to the first question I wanted to answer within my thesis. How do people with dementia engage in social activities? Sometimes people with dementia are concerned about things like getting lost, falling, or getting into an embarrassing situation. We also know from the literature that people with dementia visit fewer places outside the home for social activities. I wanted to know whether these concerns play a role in that. To answer this question, I collaborated with Karolinska Institute, a university in Sweden. 35 people with dementia living in Sweden were asked if they had these concerns and how many places they visited outside the home. We saw that people with dementia were not that concerned in this study, so it was also not surprising that we did not find an association between these concerns and the number of places visited for social activities. What we did find is that people with dementia were very aware of the challenges they faced because of dementia, such as difficulties with orientation or remembering things. Therefore, they had to pay greater attention to certain things, such as finding the way, not falling, or keeping track of their valuables, such as their wallets. To answer the first question, I also interviewed 12 couples of people living with dementia and their partners here in the Netherlands. From the stories that people told me, I found that people with dementia experience a changing world regarding their social life. They engaged more in social activities that are located within walking distance to their home. There were some activities that they were no longer doing, such as going on vacation. But they also took up new ones, such as volunteering. Some people told me that friends distanced themselves following their diagnosis. 
It was interesting to see, to me, that people played an active role in adapting to these changes. They, for example, created their own comfort zone, where they felt safe, safe and comfortable. This comfort zone included both people they felt safe with, but also environments in which they felt safe. One couple shared that they went to different campsites each year before the onset of dementia. Nowadays, this creates too much stress for the person with dementia because he had to get familiar with new environments each time. <clears throat> By going to the same campsite throughout the year, they found a solution that provided a familiar environment to the person with dementia so they could, that he could enjoy the vacation again. People also told me that they were more dependent on others. They, for example, shared that they were not allowed to drive the car anymore and therefore were more dependent on their partner to drive them somewhere, for example, to the tennis court. However, by accepting this support, they were still able to be socially engaged. In this example, to play tennis. Also, their partners experienced a changing world. They found it difficult to find a balance between the needs of their partners and their own needs and concerns. They were, for example, torn between supporting their partners to go somewhere independently, while also being worried that they might get lost on their way. Both studies showed that engaging in social activities when having dementia is quite complex. A lot of things change, both for the person with dementia and their partners. People with dementia in both studies were aware of these changes and adapted to them, for example, by choosing a context that better fits their needs. In part two, I wanted to know whether technology could play a role in helping older adults, including people with dementia, to stay socially active. Therefore, we searched the literature and found more than 2,000 studies worldwide that could help us understand it. While we found 36 studies that were relevant to my research, only three focused on people with dementia. Therefore, we could not draw any conclusions on whether technology could help people with dementia to engage in social activities. The literature search highlighted how little is known about this topic. It also highlighted again how complex social participation is, as studies defined and measured engaging in social activities differently, such as feeling lonely, having social contacts, or having social support. This made it difficult to compare study findings. One kind of technology that is often used to help people with dementia to stay socially active outside their home is GPS technology. As there is not much known about how GPS technology fit the changing needs of people with dementia, we used one exemplary app to look into that. The app is called Viamigo and has been developed by Hasselt University, originally for people with intellectual disabilities. With this app, a person with intellectual disabilities can go somewhere independently, for example to school, while a parent can follow the route on the phone and see if the child gets there safely. The routes, as in this example a route from home to school, have to be registered on a website beforehand. We wanted to know if this could also fit the needs of people with dementia. Seven people with dementia and their partners here in the Netherlands used the Viamigo for three months. After these three months, we asked some questions about their experiences using the app. Partners appreciated that they could see in real time where their partner with dementia was, as well as their phone battery level and GPS signal. But they also faced quite some technical challenges using the app, especially with registering routes on the website. While some people were satisfied with the use, Others didn't think the app had vetted L youth to their situation. Everyone stressed how important it is to tailor technology to their individual situation and unique needs, a feature that Viamigo at the moment lacks. 
Concluding, I can say that engaging in social activities is a very complex experience for people with dementia. There's a shift needed from seeing social life in dementia as a shrinking world to seeing it as a changing world. A changing world in which people with dementia actively choose a context that helps them to stay socially active. Technology could potentially play a role in that, but there's still too little known about its effects. Future research should look into how we can better define and measure engaging in social activities so that we can draw conclusions on how technology could support it in a better way. I would like to thank you all for your attention and give the word back to the Pro-Rector. Thank you very much for a clear presentation of your summary. The opposition will be opened by the chair of the thesis assessment committee, Professor Hilda Verbeek. She is Professor of Long-Term Care Environments at Maastricht University. Professor Verbeek. Thank you very much. Um, dear candidates, congratulations on your excellently written thesis, which addresses a very highly important topic, that is social participation in people living with dementia. I think uh, your thesis is very well designed, a lovely book with nice pictures and so on. And um, I think you've done a very good job in also doing international projects, collaborating with many people on your studies. And I would also like to congratulate your supervisory team in this wonderful accomplishment. Um, I would like to discuss with you some topics and starting on reflecting on the methodology. I think you've really tried to include people living with dementia in your studies and I think it's impressive that you've done that because in many scientific studies people living with dementia are still not being included or only via proxy, so how other people speak for them and you've really tried an effort using interviews and questionnaires to get their point of view. Um, but looking in hindsight, um, was that the, the, the methodology you used the best one? In your discussion, you mentioned very briefly some other methodologies, like walking interviews, for example. But I could think of others, for example, photo voicing or other methods. Could you reflect on that, uh, the methods you used, which you've now have used other ones, and how may that have influenced your results? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your compliments and your question. Um, looking back on the work I did in this thesis, uh, I do think that I would use some methodologies different than I did, uh, did now, for now. Um, like you already mentioned, the, the walking interviews, I uh, always highlight in uh, this thesis the um, how important context is uh, for experiences uh, in social participation. Um, and then uh, during the interviews, um, I think that if we would have done these interviews, for example, outside using walking interviews, then we could have gotten maybe more context-specific uh, information on how the mm -hmm. social participation uh, is experienced. Um, um, yeah, looking back on other chapters of this thesis, um, I also think that um, yeah, some things couldn't be captured because of the choices we did. For example, we did uh, we included most of the time diets of people with dementia and the informal caregiver, um, which yeah, and therefore we couldn't get into uh, more details into the experiences of people maybe living alone or without a partner. Mm -hmm. um, who are maybe even more at risk for social isolation. Mm -hmm. um, so looking back, I would also uh, try to include um, people with a higher degree of social isolation at, at baseline, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Look, talking about that, I think it's would you address a really po important topic of social role identity, and I think it's especially a strong theme in Chapter 3 on pursuing a sense of social identity, and many people with dementia there express their need, for example, of people from work to keep these contacts, or other contacts outside the very close relationships, and we know from other more sociological research that distant contacts, like the, the, the lady in the supermarket, can have a real true meaning for people. Mm -hmm. What is your view on that in the studies that we are doing into dementia and how would you, uh, did you see that in other studies as well with, with, with your topic? 
Um, I do think that it's a very valid point that uh, social participation and dementia goes beyond the closest relationships that you have, but could also be uh, going outside for a walk with the dog and uh, having a chat with the neighbor mm -hmm. while doing that. And that's also something that uh, people expressed in the interviews that we did, um, that they enjoy this kind of um, a spontaneous interaction with others where they... Um, felt uh, that they didn't have to think a lot before and uh, didn't feel that judged in the moment because it was a spontaneous interaction. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, yeah. And with that, because uh, you make some recommendations on and implications, uh, often we really tend to focus on dementia-specific services also for well-being and day activity. But wouldn't this be a more an argument for being more dementia-inclusive, like with a normal gym and a normal sports, making that? What's your view on that? And how are we able to establish that more inclusive society or environment, community? Yeah. Um, I, I totally agree with that. Also looking back to the um, uh, results we found in Chapter 3 that uh, people with dementia highly uh, appreciate doing things uh, that they find meaningful and also keep doing the things that they did before diagnosis. And that it also gives them a sense of social identity to still be part of these groups. For example, like still doing tennis with the same uh, people that you did 10 years ago. Um, so I do think that it's important to look into how we can make activities that already uh, that we already have in communities more dementia inclusive. How do we do that? <laughs> yeah. What's needed? Uh, what's needed is uh, more awareness on what is dementia. How can you better um, uh, support people with dementia in in their daily lives? Um, something that plays a big role in that is the stigma in society, I think, for, from both sides, from um, stigma around people living with dementia, but also the stigma that people with dementia have themselves, was the stealth stigma, mm -hmm. um, that they might uh, fear, for example, to continue doing these activities because they are afraid to get judged uh, by others because there is a lack, uh, lack of knowledge and awareness on dementia. Mm -hmm. So yeah. how do we achieve that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Raising awareness, um, educating people more about, uh, yeah, about what dementia is and how you can better support people, but also empowering people of dementia themselves to uh, stand up for themselves and uh, communicate with others how they want to be supported, actually. Okay. Thank you. I would like to give the word back to uh, the Pro-Rector. Thank you, Professor Verbeek. Um, your position will be continued by Professor Maud Graf. She is uh, Professor of Occupational Therapy at the Radboud University in Nijmegen. Professor Graf. Dear candidate, first of all, I would like to congratulate you and your PhD uh, supervision team with the interesting and well-described uh, thesis. I enjoyed to read this. However, I also have some questions and topics I would like to raise and discuss with you. And um, you describe in um, your thesis the social uh, participation of people with dementia through an occupational lens. And here it's not only influenced by aspects and changes at the individual level, but also at the interaction with the environment and contextual uh, factors. And you just uh, discussed uh, some of them. But um, I missed it a bit uh, deeper insight in your thesis. And can you explain some more on uh, yeah, your knowledge or findings uh, on how these aspects can influence uh, social participation? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your kind words and uh, the question. Um, When looking back on the occupational perspective on uh, the findings of this thesis, I mm -hmm. think that yeah, most the, yeah, I could reflect on that based, for example, on chapter three, um, where we looked into how people with dementia uh, adapt to changes in social participation and what uh, role the environment plays in that, and um, we saw that. Uh, people with dementia actually also seek out environments that support their social participation and continuation of social participation, mm -hmm. uh, such as people they feel safe with or 
um, yeah, environments where they felt safe that are familiar, for example. Um, and I do think that in um, other existing literature, um, we there's looked a lot into barriers and facilitators of the environment, but not that much into how the person actually shapes the environment to support their social participation needs. So. Mm-hmm. Um, that's something I think that chapter three uh, adds. Yes, and also how the environment uh, can uh, contribute eh, to yeah. feeling safe. And I think um, that also there could be a role of the occupational therapist. What do you think that occupational therapist can do <laughs> in this case to um, adapt the environment or to improve the interaction between the person and the environment? Um, I think that occupational therapists are really good in analyzing the individual situation of a person living with dementia, what the environment looks like, not only the physical, but also uh, the social environment, how how people interact with them. Uh, For example, their partner and uh, what kind of strategies they use to support their social participation. Um, And uh, an occupational therapist could, after the analyzing phase, uh, is very good with adapting actually the environment to support uh, social participation, for example. They could look into what kind of uh, environments are familiar, where do they feel safe, and how can I uh, find yeah, adapting strategies so that the person can still go there. Yeah, and can they also influence the environment? Um, yeah, for example, by... Um, yeah giving the partner more strategies on how they could communicate, for example, in a different way that the person with dementia feels more safe in the relationship. I think that's And if if you look more in society, societal roles? Um, Yeah. There's, uh, yeah, there is a role, I think, of occupational therapists also to to look into uh, societal uh, uh, developments, uh, but yeah, that's of course, uh, yeah, in the occupational therapy practice, you focus more on the individual yeah. and uh, um, yeah, their, the partners and the social environments. Um, but yeah. on a societal level, I think that are, is, uh, so occupational therapists should collaborate more with, with other healthcare professionals yeah. to uh, I think, to yes, because uh, yeah, OT also has a uh, more community role and uh, yeah. a, a role in informing stakeholders, but also adapting uh, the, the, the situation and uh, giving uh, uh, advices in, on, on that level. Yeah. Um, if I have more time, I would like to ask something about measurements. You talk about um, social uh, participation measurements, that they are not really um, covering well what you would like to measure. Um, where do you think now, uh, uh, what kind of uh, measures do you think now that could fit after you have uh, yeah, finished your work? Are there models which you can base new instruments on or other instruments you already know that can fit? Um, I do think that for example, looking at the uh, um, revised definition of levasseur of social participation, where they added that social participation is not only uh, being in interaction with others and being involved in activities with others, but also that it evolves over time and also that the context and resources plays a big role. That, uh, yeah, basing a new measurement on this definition, I think, would cover uh, the different dimensions and the dynamic uh, concept of social participation better. Um, And I also think that it's important to combine both qualitative data with uh, more quantitative data because we still want to compare study findings, of course. Um, And and, uh, the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure, have you uh, looked at that? Yeah, I think that's something that could also be used that's not only focused on social participation, but could, of course, um, yeah, be adapted and focusing more on the social uh, side of uh, Yeah, because it is is very uh, tailor-made. You can uh, work with personal goals and... uh, and, Yeah. uh, And so it it can be a very sensitive uh, measure. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
I th we have more time. Oh. <laughs> okay, then um, if we go go on, because I also was thinking about uh, the concept of Le as on an underlying uh, construct. Um, how would you then measure differences in um, in between those uh, uh, levels uh, of uh, because perhaps people stay in one level but they change. How can you make that then a measure which which could be sensitive? Um. Yeah, I think what I just um, said that uh, involving uh, qualitative uh, data on uh, how it changes over time and mm -hmm. how a person uh, reacts in specific situations could be something um, that adds value, as we mm -hmm. saw in uh, uh, chapter three where we yeah. used the interviews that you can also see how it evolves over time and how it may be in different contexts also varies. So yeah. that's something, in my opinion, that is important to Yeah, it's, I think uh, I agree, that's important as well. But I think you, also in the measure, eh, mm -hmm. you perhaps can use, um, uh, more sen make it more sensitive that you in the levels see what level of adaptation is needed then. Eh? Yeah. Uh, or um, what, um, what needs people uh, have and if they change eh, in those levels. And if yeah. that, yeah, perhaps you can combine it with more uh, person-centered way of thinking. That yeah. would be very interesting so to look I, into. I, I, I think we are looking for for a long time for these kind of measures. Yeah. So it would be nice. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think um, uh, if we look at your uh, your um, technology and how it can be adapted more tailor-made, um, what do you think that would be? more um, uh, or better solutions, uh, more tailor-made solutions after you have done your study? Uh, based on, on the, the findings of chapter... Yeah, chapter five, uh, uh, five is it? Eh? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, I think that something that could be tailored to the uh, individual person is something that, um, for example, where you can uh, add specific features or uh, have specific... Um, uh, settings that how you, that you can uh, um, adapt the app. For example, if someone needs uh, more also uh, navigating cues, that you could simply uh, tick in a box in the settings, like please also give uh, navigation cues for this person. So okay. Yeah. Yeah, and something like also that. Also in the environment, eh? that can be more uh, yeah. sensors or things that influence yeah. where you are, perhaps, eh? you, you have those technologies. But um, I saw that my time is over, so I give the word back to uh, the co-actor. Thank you, uh, Professor Graf. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Rens Brankaert. He is Associate Professor of Warm Technology for People Living with Dementia, uh, affiliated with the University of Technology in Eindhoven and with Fontys University of Applied Sciences. Uh, Dr. Brankaert. Thank you, Pro Rector. Um, dear esteemed candidate, first I also want to extend my compliments and also compliments to your supervising committee for the work, both in terms of content uh, as well as in terms of uh, presentation. Well done. Um, coming from a background in uh, design and technology, that's where I would like to focus our uh, discussion on. And I'm especially intrigued by uh, the contributions that you make there, as well as the um, advice that you kind of give to uh, others there. Um, so my first question uh, is related to a statement that you make uh, in chapter six. Um, there on page 157, you argue that um, technology developers play a role in design, which makes a lot of sense, of course. Uh, but you also say that they um, come from an other discipline and have a other approach and because of that other approach there might be an omission in their design features. Yeah, so um, your argument is that they might not be um, as attuned to maybe the perspective of someone with uh, dementia and uh, coming from a background in design and I, where I actually try to train designers to work with people with dementia as you might know, uh, I was a bit surprised by this statement. So, so I want you to maybe in light of this um, that we might do that with designers, if you could maybe elaborate a little bit on this uh, statement for me, how you exactly uh, position that. 
Um, esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your compliments and your question. Um, in uh, chapter six, I reflect on um, what potential role occupational therapists could play in the design, <coughs> but also implementation of technology. Um, and something uh, we argue is that um, designers could uh, potentially <laughs> um, have a different uh, way of thinking uh, when approaching uh, designing technology for people with dementia. Um, and what what we meant by that in this article is that um, yeah, every healthcare professional and designer and every stakeholder has their own uh, way of thinking and f yeah framework when uh, approaching technology in dementia. Um, and what we found in literature and also um, what I. So in some, yeah, have some individual <laughs> experiences uh, during my masters is that um, one different way of thinking is that healthcare professionals and I think especially occupational therapists are very uh, looking onto the individual uh, situation with the individual needs that the needs are evolving um, also in dementia over the different stages of dementia of course, but also. Um, the different maybe uh, ex exception uh, acceptance um, phases someone is after diagnosis, um, and that uh, designers sometimes oh yeah they think more from the technological side of uh, the yeah design process. Um, I think that's something that's that we maybe uh, said in a more in a two yeah. How do you say it? Stick, <laughs> maybe also a stigmatizing way, but um, yeah, what we wanted to say is that uh, everyone has different ways of thinking and frameworks when approaching design and technology. Uh, thank you for, for elaborating on that. So, if I then flip that argument around, eh? so if you say there's an omission, I, I know at the end of the chapter you show a table with all your recommendations, but if I would let uh, someone who is maybe in technology and has not the, uh, had the experience to work with people with dementia or doesn't know how to, but often letting them read then that table is not enough for them to suddenly change their practice, right? Mm. So could you maybe think of ways how we can more creatively or more openly help them to understand a little bit more of your perspective there? Um, yes, I, I totally agree. Um, um, publishing uh, study results is uh, one of the first steps to um, get findings into the broader scientific world, but of course to uh, really change something in the design process, um, we, sh we have to change something on how technology is designed uh, in, in practice, uh, the different stakeholders that are involved in that, and um, I don't think that all important stakeholders are always uh, yeah, at the same table when designing technology. So I do think that one of the first steps is to um, look who is actually uh, needed to design technology for people with dementia right. and especially people with dementia themselves. All right, thanks. <laughs> uh, so in view of time, I want to move to my, my next uh, question. Um, a little bit further in the thesis, in the next uh, final chapter, uh, there, I think you give, uh, I think, a very good suggestion. You say that maybe uh, people should engage more in co-design. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, but then I was a little bit puzzled in how you argued there, because you said, based on my work, so based on these articles, on these chapters that I worked on, I recommend people to um, engage more in co-design. So while I fully agree that co-design is very important, I was curious uh, how that was derived from your own work, since co-design is not uh, a topic <coughs> that is uh, discussed very much there. Yes. Um, what I am uh, referring to is uh, the chapter of the feasibility trial, where we um, evaluate the feasibility of the Viamigo application. Um, and we, uh, yeah, we took the Viamigo S1 exemplary app to uh, look into how GPS technology could fit the um, individual needs and changing needs of people with dementia. And one of the main findings was that um, the Viamigo at the moment uh, did not 
um, was not tailored to, could not be tailored to each individual situation and the needs that uh, participants had. For example, this one person who wanted to have something also with navigation cues or people in an earlier stage, for example, said it's maybe f more for people in a more advanced stage. Uh, while we saw that people in the more advanced stage could not use the application anymore because it was too difficult for them to use the smartphone. So one of the conclusions was it's when designing technology, one of the most important things is to uh, include people with dementia from the beginning on in the design process, which was of course not uh, done with the Viamigo as it was developed for a total different uh, population. All right. Thank you for your answer and for the discussion. I want to give the word back to the pro-rector. Thank you, uh, Dr. Van Dr. Brankhart. The next opponent is uh, Dr. Erik van Rossum. He is uh, Associate Professor of Aging and Long-Term Care, and he is affiliated with the Department of Health Service Research of Maastricht University. Dr. van Rossum. Thank you, Mr. Dear candidate. Um... Dear candidate, that's better. Um, I also enjoyed uh, reading your thesis, uh, uh, my compliments for it, and uh, of course also for the supervising uh, team. It has already been mentioned, uh, um, a very relevant theme that you addressed, and I also liked uh, the range and variety in interrelated studies that you um, um, included in your uh, thesis. Um, and what I also like, and um, is that you continue um, looking with an OT lens at people with dementia, and I appreciate that you um, combine your academic work now as an OT with people with dementia. Um, so that's a, a great choice, I think. Um, my question. Um, I would like to start um, to have a look with you at chapter four, in which you report uh, a systematic review on various studies um, looking at the effects of technology interventions to uh, improve social participation. Um, a very nice uh, uh, study, and I know how much work it is to get from over 3,000 uh, articles to 36 studies that you retrieved and you also assessed on um, various methodological issues. Um, for a part, I can follow your journey and how you uh, did that, uh, but I also have uh, some questions. And my first one is, you included a, a variety of method methodologies. So not only trials, but also qualitative studies, for instance. And um, my first question is, why did you include these qualitative studies when you are trying to get evidence on the effects of an intervention? Esteemed, op <coughs> oh, sorry. Esteemed opponent, uh, thank you for your kind words and compliments <coughs> and your question. Um, your question is related to the systematic review that we did on effects of technological interventions uh, on the social participation of um, older adults, uh, including people mm -hmm. with dementia. And um, we included different methodologies like um, mixed method studies, but also quantitative and qualitative studies. Um, and the choice was because when starting this study, um, we looked into what yeah, the landscape of uh, you know, the, the existing evidence on um, social participation interventions and dementia uh, yeah, in the field of technology. And we already saw from the beginning on that this is very limited. So that's why we went very broad with including studies in this um, systematic review, also including older adults in general, uh, but also including a variety of uh, um, yeah, research designs uh, and also qualitative studies. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I do agree that it limits... Um, yeah, it, it broadens the findings that we had, because we could also say something on pe how pe all the adults experienced the interventions, but um, yeah, it was of course limited then that we could draw conclusions on the effects of technological interventions. Mm -hmm. So did you consider, I, I understand that you're, tr you're trying to search for all these uh, uh, information, and then you see, well, 
there's an, uh, a very diverse number yeah. of publications, but still you you call it a systematic review. Did you consider to 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 name it a scoping review or another form of review? Um, well, we call it a systematic review because we still systematically uh, search the literature um, and also looked into, um, for example, the methodological um, um, strength of the papers, also the qualitative ones. Uh, of course, we had to uh, use different criteria than when using quantitative methods, but I do think that it's that it even uh, thre yeah, strengthens the, the systematic review. And um, when talking about a scoping review, I do think that it was still our aim to look into existing interventions and what, how it, they are experienced by people and also how the effects were. Uh, and we, yeah, it was not one of the main goals, for example, to look into the um, knowledge gaps that are still uh, existing, what uh, you do when you're conducting a scoping review. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would say a disadvantage of your, your, your choice is um, what you normally would do when you're waiting or assessing the evidence is uh, say, well, um, the most evidence is coming from controlled trials and the less evidence is coming from qualitative studies when you're looking at the effects of something. Yeah. And still, if you look at the, your final conclusion of your article, it seems that the information from the qualitative studies is the main input for your conclusion. Um, because you state, and I will quote uh, uh, your sentence in the conclusion, technological interventions have shown the potential to alleviate loneliness and social participation and to enhance social support. And that is mainly based on your qualitative material. Isn't that true? You may give a short answer, please. It's both, uh, based on both, on also the limited effects we found in the quantitative, but uh, we added the quali quali uh, qualitative part as well. That's true. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Van Rossum. The next opponent is uh, Dr. Franca Meiland. She is associate professor at the Department of uh, Medicine for All the People uh, at the Amsterdam University Medical Center. Dr. Thank Meiland. You. Thank you very much, Prorector. And dear candidate, uh, I also want to congratulate you with this uh, nice thesis. I, uh, yeah, others, uh, other opponents also expressed their compliments and I fully agree with them. And I especially like the chapter you were just discussing, this chapter four, because I think you had uh, yeah, different types of studies included and did a very thorough analysis of the quality of the studies and also about the agreement between the assessors. So I think that was really a very nice paper and I read the whole uh, thesis with, uh, with pleasure, I must say. I also have, of course, some questions for you. And the first of all is uh, about the main uh, topic of your thesis, social participation, uh, which is uh, one of the dimensions of the rather new concept of social health. And um, I understood also from your thesis, you're an occupational therapist. And I thought, uh, first of all, maybe you can explain that shortly, why did you choose this topic or this dimension on social participation? Um, esteemed opponent, thank you for your compliments and for your question. Um, well, I was always interested in uh, how people with dementia uh, experience their daily lives and uh, especially also the social part of it. Um, so it was also, um, yeah, partly it was more from an, uh, yeah, from my background as uh, who I am as a person, mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, I also... Uh, yeah, really like this uh, this research project because it combines social participation and technology, with a, which are both uh, things I'm very interested in. Yeah, okay. Thank you for your short answer as well. <laughs> and it is indeed an important topic, so uh, I'm glad you chose this topic. Uh, in your introduction, you describe uh, the definitions uh, on social participation. 
And uh, one of the, the definitions is the, the interdam definition, uh, which also operationalized uh, the term social participation. And later on you describe that in this thesis you will use the more recent definition of Lavazur at all. I don't know if I pronounce it well. Could you explain why you chose this definition? Um, yes, of course, I, uh, I used both definitions in, uh, in, in my work because um, the, the one of uh, uh, the Interim Social Health Task Force, uh, of course, uh, operationalized the concept of social participation uh, from the definition of, uh, of social health. Um, for people with dementia, so that's something we also used uh, in the studies. Um, and why I chose the, the newly uh, the dev revised definition of levasseur was that um, looking from this occupational perspective where experience can be separated from the context, I like that in the definition of levasseur they um, especially uh, state that social participation evolves in time, but also from... Uh, yeah, the context that uh, they are situated in. So I think it says uh, time construct and uh, uh, environment. I, I can say it right now, but... Yeah, I have it for me. It, it is oh. quite a complicated definition, it's about I, the context, I thought. So I yeah. thought, wow, it's a, it's a whole mouthful. <laughs> but yeah, I hear you say you find uh, this definition makes it more explicit, I think. Because I don't think it is not... Uh, the context is not important in the, in the, in the interdem definition. Yeah, it makes it But I was wondering about one other thing, and that's in the interdem definition. It is especially... Uh, operationalized for people with dementia. Mm -hmm. If I'm well informed, this Lavazur, uh, Lavazur definition is not specifically for people with dementia. Does that matter, do you think? Um, that's, that's true, the one of Lavazur is for more in general, uh, or for other adults in general. Um, so, looking for example for chapter four, the systematic review, where we also included older adults uh, uh, in general uh, in the review. So I think that this definition covers then both um, uh, types of participants that we included. Um, I think that, oh yeah, we see in chapter three also that uh, social participation changes with dementia uh, because of the changes that dementia brings, but um, I don't think that it's actually different from maybe uh, someone uh, older living with um, another disease or um, with other individual uh, restrictions uh, because they also um, yeah, experience changes that they adapt to. Of course, it's very specific in dementia, but um, I do think that keeping it in a broader context didn't... Uh, yeah limit the, the research. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I would like to go to another uh, subject, and that's uh, your chapter five, in which you did a feasibility study uh, of a GPS tracking system called Viamigo. You just explained it also. Um, and uh, I, um, yeah, there are, of course, many uh, tracking devices, also many already used for people with dementia. I missed a bit in, it, in your chapter uh, a description of various types of GPS trackers and also why you chose this Viamigo uh, tracker. So could you explain yeah, why you chose for this uh, type of, tra of tracker? Um, yeah, we chose uh, the Viamigo because it was already used in, in other studies and with different target populations, uh, for example, uh, people with intellectual disabilities and uh, that from... Uh, research studies could show that um, it had a uh, significant uh, impact on the uh, independent out of home mobility of people with intellectual disabilities. Um, so we chose it as one example of technology to look into how it, if it could also be something for people with dementia. Uh, I think we could have also. Uh, chosen another technology to uh, look into how technology actually fit their changing needs. So, um, it, yeah, 
it also comes from uh, a collaboration, of course, with Hartford University. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, also yeah. a practical reason for it. And uh, no, I understand. And I thought maybe because you say in that chapter that you uh, want to address the individual needs and wishes of people with dementia, I could also imagine that in a study you would use different GPS trackers mm -hmm. to see yeah, what fits best the needs of the different uh, people involved also. Yeah, that would but, be interesting. Um, yeah, that would be another study. I uh, understand that my time is, oh. uh, is up, so I will give the word back to the Pro-Rector. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Meiland. Uh, the opposition will be continued uh, by the last opponent, which is, uh, who is uh, Professor Sebastian de Keuler. He is a Professor of Neuroepidemiology at Maastricht University. Professor Keuler. Yes, uh, dear candidate, um, first of all, I would like to uh, echo the compliments already expressed by my colleagues for your work. Being the last run in the row, I didn't uh, prepare a lengthy laudatio, so I will just jump into the question. Um, and I would like to, to challenge your, your framing um, of uh, um, social participation as being uh, due to a changing world um, of, of a person living with dementia. So um, when, what I understood from uh, how you uh, posit it, it's um, kind of uh, so social disengagement, um, lower participation, also feelings of loneliness might be kind of coping mechanism of the person, him or herself, or the social environment to, um, to the person having dementia and the challenges and the insecurities that uh, come with dealing with that um, in social situations. Um, However, um, I wondered, um, is this always the case? So, so is this always uh, due to, to, to changes that come with uh, uh, experiencing dementia? Or might it also be um, already a pre-morbid characteristic of that person um, um, having low social participation and engagement? Um, and does this matter? Were you able to, to distinguish between these two in your, in your studies? And what were your insights? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your compliments and uh, the question. Um, I um, def yeah, we saw in, in chapter three that people also had different levels of social participation, but um, I recognize that m most participants that were included in this study were uh, quite active in their social life. Um, and there are, of course, other people who are maybe uh, not that uh, active anymore, maybe don't have a partner. Um, or um, were never that uh, socially active in their life and don't have these uh, social needs maybe on the same level. So um, I do think it plays a role in, uh, in social participation and dementia. But I still think that dementia brings some changes in social participation, no matter what the level of uh, social uh, participation was uh, before, because of the... yeah different things that, that are happening on an individual level, uh, disease-related factors, things that uh, remembering things, but also uh, the stigma that comes with uh, dementia. So I still think that it, it makes a difference in how they experience social participation, but it still changes over time. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm pretty sure that it also has an impact and, uh, and, and can also aggravate uh, pre-existing um, problems. Um, but do you think that, that there is enough um, appreciation of that or do, do existing interventions and especially when it comes to technology, which is not very much individually tailored maybe, um, you know, does take this into account sufficiently and in your work as an occupational therapist, is this something you are also looking into? How was the pre-morbid level of uh, participation? Does it influence your work? Um, well, these are two questions, one on the academic level and one of the uh, practical level. So going to the academic one, um, I think that's something that's, um, that's yeah, one limitation of our studies that we included people with a, um, higher degree of uh, social participation in the beginning. So uh, I do think it's very interesting to look into people with a more, um, who are more socially isolated at baseline, which is something that also other studies report um, that this is still something is lagging. And I think one of the problems is um, how do we rec recruit these people? How do we 
um, get in contact because they may be, um, yeah, we also recruited via community settings, for example, and if they don't go there, how do we reach them? Um, mm -hmm. And from a more practical point of view as an OT, you actually do, uh, do look into participation before, so you ask the individual um, what was it, uh, what was the situation before, so you uh, take that into account when uh, looking into the possible next steps. Okay, well, that's good to know. Um, <laughs> and uh, so in, in, in my research and work, we, we are also looking into social participation, loneliness, because they are um, uh, considered risk factors for developing dementia, So this, which is also related to the question just asked. And um, so we give a lot of also um, um, advice to people and educate people on the issue of brain health. And I also saw it in your presentation and uh, mm -hmm. uh, coming back, uh, this aspect. Um, and what people often ask me then is, uh, um, is social participation and interaction also important when you already have dementia? And does it also slow cognitive decline uh, when you have dementia. And I wondered whether you, in your, in your studies, your the literature that you read, came across something for that, because I often don't know the answer. Um, yeah, well, it, it's something actually that participants mentioned in chapter three that as a motivation to uh, stay socially active, because they say it's good for my brain, so I keep, uh, yeah, keep meeting people and keep going out there to stimulate my brain. So I don't have an answer on if uh, that actually uh, has an effect on uh, cognitive decline when already having dementia, because that's something that's still missing in, in the literature. But uh, I could imagine that it has. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's very important that you say that it's an important motivation, because yeah, if, if uh, a lot of these um, activities fail, that might be something, if you would show that evidence, that might uh, yep. Bring people to engage more in social participation. Thank you. Yes, Mrs. Heinz, as you may have noticed, the time for defending your thesis is, has passed. The committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and, in particular, the quality of your defense. And uh, I would like to ask you to, uh, to remain here and uh, uh, wait until we return with the results of our deliberation. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. is tied long road i don't waste no time break rules because fate decides with the team and we chase the light i make a move fall down shake it off i hate to lose that branch break it off no room for negativity praise and love prepare for deep park because we're taking off Take the mileage,
even though these nights seem long, I know that I am never on my own. Know you won the battle once you Outside. Ten miles in my rearview mirror. I know what it felt like. My goals only getting clearer. East side to the west side. No place like home. If it's questions that you've got, go the extra mile and die. Long road to the south side. Ten miles in my rearview mirror. I know what it felt like. My goals only getting clearer. East side to the west side. No place like home. If it's questions that you've got.
Mevrouw Pascal Heids, the, the Greek committee here present has discussed the, and assessed the quality of your thesis and in particular quality of your defense. And in view of this positive verdict, and taking into, into account, of course, your previous qualifications, the committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. And your supervisor, Professor de Vught, is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch University custom and law. Professor de Vught, the floor is yours. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent and responsible? Yes, I promise. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Pascala Heinz, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now pre present you with a degree certificate signed by the director, the sec secretary, and the other members of the committee and affixed with the official seal of the university. Esteemed Dr. Heinz, and dear Pascal, you did it. And what an amazing job you did. Congratulations on your well-deserved PhD degree, also for your family members and Ronnie, of course, who supported you through this journey. Your journey started approximately four years ago with a vacancy for an early stage researcher within the distinct network. You already saw the position popping up once, but the timing wasn't right. And when you saw it for a second time, it felt right and you applied. And after a very good reference from your master supervisor, there was no doubt about it. You were the best candidate. And you started your PhD in November 2019 at Maastricht University and the Alzheimer Center Limburg. Led by Marjolein, Frans and Anne, and I joined the supervision team a bit later as your daily supervisor. From our first meeting, I was convinced that you were a supervisor's dream. An independent, enthusiastic, proactive, well-prepared and extremely smart young woman, full of ambition and ideas. And your colleagues at the ACL also describe you as indispensable. You're always ready to help out and listen to daily hassles, not only of your fellow PhDs, but also of me as your supervisor. And I think your open and kind character is also reflected by the acknowledgement section of your PhD thesis, which reads how much you value others but to me, it shows clearly how much others value you. While you're the dream of many colleagues and your supervisors, your PhD journey sometimes gave you nightmares. <laughs> for one, COVID hit in March 2020, derailing your plans for a secondment at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. However, clever and resourceful as you are, you were able to do the secondment remotely with a very interesting paper and a wonderful new collaboration as a result. But working remotely during the pandemic was not that easy. Despite the joys of having your cat run around on your keyboard, you were very honest about the challenges of strictly working from home. And together with your fellow roommates, you set up a system to make sure everyone was able to have days at the office and support each other. And thankfully, during your second secondment at Silverfit, you were able to come to the office and learn the ropes of the business side of technology for dementia. 
Sorry for the long speech. <laughs> <laughs> and what we as a team value deeply about you is that you always turn difficult situations into challenges to overcome with your great sense of humor as your salvation. And one thing that was not at all a challenge for you was making an impact with your research. As a volunteer at the Alzheimer Cafe, you stay connected with people with dementia and the carers. And you bring your results back to the participants as a frequent presenter in other cafes and at the Dementia Dialogues. Not to mention the countless international presentations you held at, for instance, the World Occupational Science Conference in Canada, ADI in London, and Alzheimer Europe in Bucharest and Helsinki. And while you learned a lot during your PhD, I was also very lucky to learn a lot from you. And a few examples of the many lessons we as your supervision team learned from Dr. Heinz. Number one, how to match your PowerPoint presentation with the season and your current <laughs> mood using Canva. Which memes are hot, because let's face it, you're the meme queen of the ACL. How to read documents without markups and create groups in Outlook. I had no idea you could do that. How to check connected studies using connected papers that Belgium has a German area, shame on me for not knowing this, and the essential role of peer support and training for early stage researchers. And this last one was especially important to you because next to your own challenging projects and secondments, you made sure to stand up for your peers at the distinct e as the distinct ESR, ESR representative, as co-organizer of the distinct schools, I start meetings and Interdam Academy sessions. Your passion for your work really has no limits. The last days leading up to your deadline, you still had your work cut out for you. But you also wanted to develop your OT profession. So why not spend an entire day at the EDOMA course when you only have two days before your deadline? You were set out to go on holiday after submitting your manuscript, but you weren't satisfied. So the moment you arrived in Rome, you worked through the night on those last pages, which of course was a lot of fun for you, Ronnie. But luckily, good things come to those who work as hard as you do. On the day you were supposed to hear back from the reading committee, you learned that your little one on the way was completely healthy. What a relief, putting all the work stress into perspective, followed by another great message that your manuscript was approved with flying colors. Dear, dear Pascal, you once told me that you have a reminder saying I am enough. But I hope by now you know that for us, you are more than enough. We are very grateful that you have decided to stay in academia and that we will work together in the Spread Plus Consortium. While you will be combining your academic skills with your passion for supporting people with dementia and their caregivers as an occupational therapist. Now the time has come to enjoy this amazing achievement in your career while looking ahead at the amazing adventure in your personal life, becoming a family together with Ronnie. So on behalf of Marjolein, Frans, Anne and myself, I would like to thank you for your hard work and your dedication and everything that you have taught us. The many lessons of Dr. Heinz. And with this, I would like to give the word back to the Pro-Rector. Now you're back, esteemed Dr. <laughs> Heinz. Dear Pascal, it's my great pleasure to congratulate you with your doctorate and I congratulate you also on behalf of Maastricht University. And I would like to share some impressions uh, with you. Um, we have seen a very clear and concise presentation, a summary of your thesis. And I hope that not only we, but also people in the audience and on the live stream have seen quite clearly what you have done in the last couple of years. Um, your thesis is interesting um, has shown various type of studies and also we have seen that the scientific literature is covered quite well and it has a good uh, chapter on the discussion which is appreciated and you have seen we have seen in your defense uh, um, well various uh, perspectives on on the topic that you have studied uh, a mix of academic and, and, and practical aspects um, well, we have seen also a, an honest and, and convincing and also determined way of defending your thesis. We appreciated that and I congratulate not only you with that result, 
but also your four supervisors. Um, your primary supervisors, uh, Professor Marjolein um, de Vught, uh, Professor Frans van Heij, but also your uh, co-supervisors, uh, Dr. Lizzie Boots and Dr. Arneve. Congratulations with this result that we have seen in the form of a of an in very interesting thesis and a good defense. Um, I would like to include in my congratulations also um, your family, your partner and your parents and other members of the family, which I suppose are sitting on the first row here. Congratulations. And not only you, but also I would like to include also your uh, former colleagues, um, other friends and people that have contributed to uh, your thesis and to the final result that we have seen today. Um, I would like to thank all members of both committees, so not only um, this degree committee, but also the thesis assessment committee. You have all critically read the thesis, and we had an interesting discussion and, and good questions. So thank you for that. And in particular, I would like to thank the external members of the committee. Thank you for joining this committee. Uh, Maastricht University appreciates your contributions. Thank you again. Um, well, we come to an end of the academic uh, session, academic ceremony. Um, I would like to um, ask you if we are, when we have left uh, this aula, um, then I would like to ask the members of your family to stay here and to join us when we are leaving first. And I would like to invite uh, the other people here in the audience to go to the rafter where there is a reception and we can uh, congratulate you there personally. Hereby, I close this academic ceremony at Maastricht University.